Hi everyone, and welcome back to our next video on optimization for machine learning, and in particular on the constraint case. Right? The last three videos have been about the question how we can include constraints in our optimization problem. So I'm, I'm calling this COP for constraint optimization problem for this video. So we do have this loss function and we have additional inequality and equality constraints. These can be viewed to say numerical purposes like regularization parameters. These can also uh, you know, encode knowledge that we have of our system. Let's say physics knowledge in the form of differential equations or whatever you can think of, energy conservation and so on. And so we have now really only covered the theory. Right? We've in the end this culminated in the KKT or Karuch kuntaka conditions which tell us, well, there are these conditions that the derivatives of the loss function plus multipliers times the derivatives of the constraints have to be zero. And then we had these let's say a little bit wiggly additional conditions in order to account for the active inequality constraints. But still, you know, this is something that is theoretically very valid and many methods build on this. But now I would like to talk to you about two strategies that go a slightly different way that are frequently used to practically solving these types of problems. So the question of this video is really how to solve the constraint optimization problem COP that I've drawn here. And two ways to do this are what well, the video is called penalty methods and what's called sequential quadratic programming or SQP. And let's start with the, the penalty methods. So approach number one would be to take the constraint and you guess it already I guess because it's something we have seen a couple of times now. We take the constraint and transfer it into a loss, right? in the form of a penalty term. Right, so this is why it's called penalty method. And so what we get is actually something that is, should look somewhat familiar. So we minimize again over our parameters w, the loss function L of w. And then we add as a penalty term, right? And I'm going to talk to you about the name penalty in a bit more detail in a second, we have the scaling parameter, and then in this bracket we add penalty functions, okay? So for the inequality constraints, these can be these phi functions of the inequalities. And for the equality constraints, we have basically the same structure. So j from one till n equality by head can be some other type of function. I will go into the details in a second of the inequality, uh, sorry, the equality constraints. Okay, and now this in brackets gives us the penalty term. So what we have here is a few design decisions. Okay, we have these phi and phi head, which are functions that we can design ourselves. So in which way to penalize the constraint violation. This is what we want to do. This term becomes large if the constraint is violated. This term becomes small or in the best case zero if the constraint is not violated. Okay, and so this means that if we crank this up, you know, make this more important, and this is what the tau is for, then we can enforce these constraints not exactly, but well, close enough. And for many applications, this is suitable. Okay, so if the tau goes to zero, then we divide by zero, meaning that this goes really, really up. And so this means that satisfaction of the constraints becomes really important over the um, original loss function. And so there's tuning parameters, this one, and what you can also think of now is how to design these penalty functions, right? You can say for the inequality case, one example, doesn't have to be, but could be take the max over zero or the constraint and raise it to some power r, okay? So this means once the constraint is satisfied, meaning that this one is less than zero for equality, then this is taking the max is zero, okay? So for negative values of c, this one's zero, it's all fine. If the constraint is violated, this is positive, it grows quickly with, well, depending on the power we raise it to. So this is what we call an outer penalty. Oh, no, wait, let's just go outer penalty. Before I get there, let's draw a small sketch to show you what this means. Okay, so let's now look at this one. 
And from left to right, we are asking ourselves not about the loss function or the parameter value as we did before, but about the constraint function value, okay, for the ice functions. So what does it mean? The zero is really important. And this is our barrier function now, okay? So this, or not necessarily barrier function, this is our penalty function. Um, meaning if we're left of the zero, we're happy. There should not be any penalty. If we're right of this function, we are not so happy because it should be, this is all in the form of inequalities, right? For equalities, both left and right are bad, obviously. Um, and then we would like to have a penalty that somehow is, changes its behavior at the zero, okay? So here at the left, we have C is negative and everything's fine. So this one is the good case. And here we have it positive, this is the bad case. So we want to avoid this region and we want to not avoid this region. And you see that this penalty precisely does this, right? Once we're left, it's zero. As soon as we go right, this one kicks in and we raise it to some power. So what we get is, and this now depends on the tau, we get a function that may look like this, okay? And if we increase the tau, oh no, the smiley face becomes even sadder, we have a increase of how strong, oh sorry, not the tau increases, but the tau goes to zero, okay? So the, the, it shrinks, meaning the smaller we make it, the harsher we penalize our constraint violation. So this is what we call an outer penalty. And there's alternatively a way to have an inner barrier. This is now called the penalty method. Inner would mean that we call this a barrier, right? So an example could be that we say this is minus one over C of W, okay? Well, it's not so well visible in blue now, but here you see minus one over C. This one means that if the constraint is negative, then we're fine because one over a negative number means that it's a positive term. But as we approach zero, so the constraint gets closer and closer to the point where it, you know, is violated, this one blows up. And in the limit, we divide by zero. So what we have here is a function that looks like this, right? So and as we approach zero with the penalty, oh, it's not so well visible, let's take the orange color now, it goes up. And again, if we take the push the tau to zero, this becomes more severe, right? So we see penalty methods, whether it's an outer penalization or it's, whether it's this barrier method, um, are good ways to simply transform a constraint optimization problem into an unconstrained one. And depending on how severe you want to enforce your constraints, you would stick to barrier methods, right? Here it's, apparently it's obvious that we cannot violate the constraint because this will go to infinity. Um, or otherwise we can take this one, but here we have to accept that some small violation can happen. Still, we are now in business because we need to solve an unconstrained optimization problem and we know how to do this by now. We can use gradient descent, momentum, stochastic gradient descent, whatever, all these fall now into this area and we can solve them. So this brings us to part number two, right? We said penalty methods, so constraint into loss, now there's a second strategy that we can follow. Let's say we do not want to go this way. Maybe constraints are more important. Um, another thing that one can do, and which is also a very common strategy, is to simplify your problem, okay? Here we had constraints go into a loss function. What we're going to do now in problem number two, or strategy number two, is to replace our constraint optimization problem by simpler problems, but not by a single one, but by a sequence of simpler problems. Okay, so we're saying, instead of solving one hard problem, let's solve many problems, which is fine if the individual problems are simple. And so the sequence, is what gives this the name of sequential quadratic programming, or SQ. 
u p, okay? So sequential means a sequence, q p means a quadratic program, which means a quadratic loss function and linear constraints, right? So this is what we're going to use, quadratic loss function, or a quadratic approximation of L. Right, so I get to, to this in a second. And a linear approximation of C and C hat. Okay, And so all of a sudden, well, we need to solve more than one problem, but the sequence of easily solvable problems, right? And the next video is going to be all about how to solve this simple problem. What we get now is this new version, right? Let's write it here. So minimize, oh, one thing that I'm going to say is, um, before we go there, I define that my update in the weight is defined as W of K, or the Kth iteration plus this update SK. So I'm going to derive a quadratic approximation in terms of S. So the difference that I'm going to need to move from WK to WK plus one. So the problem now becomes minimize this SK. And the index is now important because I need to solve this sequentially, sequentially multiple times. So this SK is now my Q updates for the weights. And this is now my quadratic function, okay? So L of WK plus a linear term, which is going to be the gradient of L of WK transpose times SK plus, and now a quadratic term, which is going to be one half SK transposed HK, which is the Hessian matrix, times SK. Okay, now this looks awfully complicated at first sight, but really it's, it's very simple. What you see here is a Taylor series expansion of our loss function around our current iterate. Okay, so what this means is take the loss function now and express the loss function at WK plus one, so meaning WK plus SK, in terms of a Taylor series expansion in the form of the linear term and the second order term. So really, this is a, a truncated Taylor series expansion, and so this means really find the optimal step size for this quadratic model. Okay, so how far should I move to minimize this quadratic approximation of our loss function? This is why it's a quadratic program. But this is only half of the story. What I need, so this was the quadratic approximation here. And now in a different color, I'm going to use the linear approximation of the constraints. Okay, so what I have now is subject to CI of W. Oh, I'm, excuse me, we also have this iterate now. CI of WK plus gradient of CI WK transposed SK is smaller than or equal to zero for all I, right? So this holds for all the constraints. So what you see is again, I'm linearizing my constraint around the current iterate, okay? So it's a Taylor series expansion up to first order. So it's a line along which this has to hold. Remember, what I'm optimizing over is this SK. So this is my optimization variable only, which means only this part is my optimization variable and here is a quadratic variable, right? So in this case, I'm fixing the W because I'm optimizing over the S and this is also what appears here. And the same holds for the inequality constraint and then we're done, C hat of WK plus, and now this is exactly the same as before, cj hat of wk transposed sk equal to zero for all j. 
right? And again, we have this situation that this SK really is the optimization variable. And now you have it. This is our second strategy. Um, what we need to do is until convergence is two steps. Approximate, so build approximate model. So build our quadratic program, so quadratic loss function, linear constraints, and solve the QP. This gives us our W k plus one. Right, and this is at W k. Okay, so we build at our current iterate this quadratic approximation, we minimize it and get our update until convergence. So, and this concludes our, I guess, rather long video, but you now have a very good intuition what you can do, right? We can use constraints in the loss function in terms of penalty methods and then use unconstrained methods. However, you see there are challenges with how we really approach this constraint. And in particular, if we do have equality constraints, you see that this tends to become very, uh, very challenging. If tau goes close to zero, then this means this becomes very steep. So numerically, it's very hard to tackle these types of problems. And so here's the second venue that you can use. Instead of solving one challenging problem, we solve a sequence of quadratic programs. So quadratic loss functions, which is just a Taylor series expansion of our loss function around our current iterate. And as the constraints, a linear Taylor series expansion for equality and inequality constraints. And so this almost concludes our series on optimization for machine learning. What's left to do is this very last line here, how to solve the quadratic program. And then we can actually implement this and this one too, because well, for this one we already know things. This one, after this point, we're good to go. Thank you.